Mount Kilimanjaro. Mount Kilimanjaro, with its three volcanic cones, Kibo, Mwenzi, and Shira, is a dormant volcanic mountain in Tanzania. It is the highest mountain in Africa and the highest freestanding mountain in the world at 5,895 meters or 19,341 feet above sea level. Geology Kilimanjaro is composed of three distinct volcanic cones, Kibo, the highest at 5,895 m, 19,341 feet. Mwenzi at 5,149 m, 16,893 feet. And Shira, the shortest at 3,962 m, 13,000 feet. Uyuru Peak is the highest summit on Kibo's crater rim. Kilimanjaro is a large stratovolcano. Of its three peaks, Mwenzi and Shira are extinct, while Kibo, the highest, is dormant and could erupt again. The last major eruption has been dated to between 150,000 and 200,000 years ago. Although dormant, Kibo has gas-emitting fumaroles in its crater. Several collapses and landslides have occurred on Kibo in the past, one creating the area known as the Western Breach. History Name The origin of the name Kilimanjaro is not precisely known, but a number of theories exist. European explorers had adopted the name by 1860 and reported that Kilimanjaro was the mountain's Kiswahili name. But according to the 1907 edition of the Nuthall Encyclopedia, the name of the mountain was Kilima Njaro. Johann Ludwig Krapf wrote in 1860 that Swahilis along the coast called the mountain Kilimanjaro. Although he did not support his claim, he claimed that Kilimanjaro meant either mountain of greatness, or mountain of caravans. Under the latter meaning, Kilima meant mountain, and Jaro possibly meant caravans. Jim Thompson claimed in 1885 although he also did not support his claim. According to a website owned by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Njaro is an ancient Kiswahili word for shining. Similarly, Krapf wrote that a chief of the Wakamba people, whom he visited in 1849, had been to Jagger and had seen the Kaima Jaja, Mountain of Whiteness, the name given by the Wakamba to Kilimanjaro, more correctly in the Kakamba language, this would be Kiima Kai and this possible derivation has been popular with several investigators. Others have assumed that Kalima is Kiswahili for mountain. The problem with this assumption is that Kalima actually means hill, and is, therefore, the diminutive of Mlima, the proper Kiswahili word for mountain. However, T is possible that an early European visitor, whose knowledge of was not extensive, changed Mlima to Kilima by analogy with the two Shaga names, Kibo and Kimawenzi. A different approach is to assume that the Kilman part of Kilimanjaro comes from the Kikaga Kalim, which means, which defeats, or Kililima, which means, which has become difficult or impossible. The Jaro part would then be derived from Njaare, a bird, or, according to other informants, a leopard, or, possibly from Jaro a caravan. In the 1880s, the mountain became a part of German East Africa and was called Kalima Ndscharo in German following the Kiswahili name components. On October 6, 1889, Hans Mayer reached the highest summit on the crater ridge of Kibo. He named it Kaiser Wilhelm Spitz, Kaiser Wilhelm Peak. That name apparently was used until Tanzania was formed in 1964, when the summit was renamed Uyuru meaning Freedom Peak in Kiswahili. The Kaiser Wilhelm Spitz, with its altitude of 5895 meters, 19,340 feet was known at the time as the highest mountain of the German Empire. Climbing history According to the famous English geographer Harford Mackinder, it was the missionary Redman of Mombasa who, in 1848, first reported the existence of Kilimanjaro. In 1861, the German officer Baron Karl Claus von der Decken and the young British geologist Richard Thornton, 1838-1863, made a first attempt to climb Kibo, but got no farther than 8,200 feet, 
2,500 meters. In 1862, von der Decken tried a second time together with Otto Kersen. They reached a height of 14,000 feet, 4,280 meters. In 1887, during his first attempt to climb Kilimanjaro, the German geology professor Hans Mayer reached the base of Kibo, but was forced to turn back, not having the equipment necessary to handle the deep snow and ice on Kibo. The following year, Mayer planned another attempt with cartographer Oscar Bowman, but the mission was aborted due to consequences of the Abushiri revolt. Mayer and Bowman were captured and held hostage, and only escaped after a 10,000 rupees ransom had been paid. In 1889 Mayer returned to Kilimanjaro with the celebrated Austrian mountaineer Ludwig Perchella for a third attempt. Their climbing team included two local headmen, nine porters, a cook, and a guide. The success of this attempt, which started on foot from Mombasa, was based on the establishment of many campsites with food supplies so that multiple attempts at the top could be made without having to descend too far. Mayer and Perchella pushed near the crater rim on October 3, but turned around exhausted from hacking footsteps in the icy slope. Three days later they reached the highest summit on the southern rim of the crater on Perchella's 40th birthday, October 6, 1889. They were the first to confirm that Kibo has a crater, which was filled with ice at the time. After descending to the saddle between Kibo and Mwenzi, Mayer and Perchella attempted to climb the more technically challenging Mwenzi next, but could only reach a 5096m high subsidiary peak, later to be named Clute Peak, before retreating due to illness. On October 18, they reascended Kiba to enter and study the crater, cresting the rim at Hans Mayer's notch. In total, Mayer and Perchella spent 16 days above 4200m during their expedition. The summit of Kibo wouldn't be climbed again until 20 years later by the surveyor M. Lang in 1909. The first ascent of the highest summit of Mwenzi was only on July 29, 1912, by the German climbers Edward Awea and Fritz Klute, who christened it Hans Mayer Peak in Mayer's honor. Awea and Klute went on to make the third ascent of Kibo, via the western route over the Drigalski Glacier. In 1989, the organizing committee of the 100-year celebration of the first ascent decided to award posthumous certificates to the African porter guides who had accompanied Mayer and Perchella. One person in pictures or documents of the 1889 expedition was thought to match a living inhabitant of Morangu, Yuani Kanala Lawu. Lawu did not know his own age nor did he remember Mayer or Perchella, but he remembered joining a Kilimanjaro expedition involving a Dutch doctor who lived near the mountain and that he did not get to wear shoes during the eight-day affair. Law claimed that he had climbed the mountain three times before World War I. The committee concluded that he had been a member of Mayer's team and therefore must have been born around 1871. Law died on May 10, 1996 and is now often suggested as co-first descendant of Kilimanjaro. Mapping. Early maps of Kilimanjaro were published by the British government's Directorate of Overseas Surveys, DOS 422Y742, in 1963. These were based on air photography carried out as early as 1959 by the RAF. These were on a scale of 1, 50,000 with contours at 100 feet intervals. These are now unavailable. Tourist mapping was first published by the Ordnance Survey in England in 1989 based on the original DOS mapping, 1, 100,000, 100 feet intervals, DOS 522. This is also no longer available. EWP produced a map with tourist information in 1990, 1, 75,000, 100 m contour intervals, in set maps of Kibo and Mwenzi on 1, 20,001. 30,000 scales respectively and 50m contour interval. In the last few years, numerous other maps have become available of various qualities. 3D route maps are also available online. Trekking Kilimanjaro There are seven official trekking routes by which to ascend and descend Mount Kilimanjaro, Lamosu, Makaim, Morangu, Mwakar, Rongai, Shira, and Umbwe. Of all the routes, Makame is considered the most scenic, albeit steeper, route. 
it can be done in six or seven days. The Rongai is the easiest and least scenic of all camping routes. The Marangu is also relatively easy, but this route tends to be very busy, the ascent and descent routes are the same, and accommodation is in shared huts with all other climbers. People who wish to trek to the summit of Kilimanjaro are advised to undertake appropriate research and ensure that they are both properly equipped and physically capable. Though the climb is technically not as challenging as when climbing the high peaks of the Himalayas or Andes, the high elevation, low temperature, and occasional high winds make this a difficult and dangerous trek. Acclimatization is essential, and even the most experienced trekkers suffer some degree of altitude sickness. Kilimanjaro summit is well above the altitude at which high altitude pulmonary edema or high altitude cerebral edema can occur. All trekkers will suffer considerable discomfort, typically shortage of breath, hypothermia, and headaches. High altitude climbing clubs Citing safe ascent rate suggestions offered by organizations such as the Royal Geographical Society, have criticized the Tanzanian authorities for charging fees for each day spent on the mountain. It was once argued that this fee structure encouraged trekkers to climb rapidly to save time and money, while proper acclimatization demands that delays are built into any high climb. However, in response to this accusation, the Tanzania National Parks Authority several years ago mandated minimum climb durations for each route. These regulations prohibit climbs of fewer than five days on the Maranga route, and ensure a minimum of six days for the other five sanctioned routes. These minimums, particularly in the case of Marangu, which ostensibly allows that Iuru Peak can be reached from a starting elevation at 1860 m within 72 hours of beginning the ascent are reckoned by most alpinists to allow an ascent rate that will usually result in a climber failing to acclimatize adequately, by the time that Kibo huts are reached. The launch base from which the summit is assaulted. Consequently, the incidence of acute mountain sickness, AMS, is widely deemed to be unacceptably high on Kilimanjaro, with high volumes of fit young people succumbing to the condition, having opted for a relatively rapid ascent. As a general rule, it is far safer, and more enjoyable, to avoid altitude sickness by planning a sensible itinerary that allows for gradual acclimatization to high elevation as one ascends. Operations that typically see in excess of a thousand climbers summiting annually and are best placed to identify such patterns, usually posit that an optimal climb length should last around seven to eight days. Tanzanian medical services around the mountain have expressed concern recently over the current influx of tourists that apparently perceive Kilimanjaro as an easy walk. However this is not the case. Many individuals require significant attention during their attempts, and many are forced to abandon the trek. An investigation into the matter concluded that tourists visiting Tanzania were often encouraged to join groups heading up the mountain without being made aware of the significant physical demands of the climb, although many outfitters and tour operators flaunt high success rates for reaching the summit. The Kilimanjaro National Park shows that only 41% of trekkers actually reach the Uluru summit with the majority turning around at Guildman's Point, 300 meters, 980 feet, short of Uluru or Stella Point, 200, 660 feet, meters short of Uluru. Kilimanjaro is often underestimated because it can be walked and is not a technical climb. However, many mountaineers consider Kilimanjaro very physically demanding. Some estimate that more people have died to date trekking up Kilimanjaro than Mount Everest but Everest is attempted by significantly fewer climbers. In August 2007 four trekkers died within a week underscoring the point that trekking to the summit should not be taken casually. Multiple people, such as trekkers, porters, and guides, die on the mountain each year. The majority of these deaths are porters due to hypothermia. Trekkers fall on steep portions of the mountain, and rock slides have killed trekkers. For this reason, the route via the Arrow Glacier was closed for several years. It reopened in December 2007, but the park officials advise against taking that route and tell trekkers that they can climb, but at their own risk. When attempting the Arrow Glacier route, trekkers must leave early in the morning and make it past the rock face before mid-afternoon is when the sun comes out, and frozen rock slides become quite common.
unique vegetation. Being an Afromontane sky island, Kilimanjaro has an enormous biodiversity while low in endemic species. However endemics include the giant ground soles in the bunch grass tussock grasslands, and other flora adapted to living in alpine plant conditions. Kilimanjaro has a large variety of forest types over an altitudinal range of 3000 m, 9843 feet, containing over 1200 vascular plant species. Montana Cotia forests occur on the wet southern slope. Cassipurea and Juniperus forests grow on the dry northern slope. Subalpine Erica forests at 4100 m, 13451 feet represent the highest elevation cloud forests in Africa. In contrast to this enormous biodiversity, the degree of endemism is low. However, forest relics in the deepest valleys of the cultivated lower areas suggest that a rich forest flora inhabited Mount Kilimanjaro in the past, with restricted range species otherwise only known from the eastern Arcade Mountains. The low degree of endemism on Kilimanjaro may result from destruction of lower elevation forest rather than the relatively young age of the mountain. Another feature of the forests of Kilimanjaro is the absence of a bamboo zone, which occurs on all other tall mountains in East Africa with a similarly high rainfall. Sinirundanaria alpina stands are favored by elephants and African buffaloes elsewhere. On Kilimanjaro these ngehbivores occur on the northern slopes where it is too dry for a large bamboo zone to develop. They are excluded from the wet southern slope forests by topography and humans, who have cultivated the foothills for at least 2,000 years. This interplay of biotic and abiotic factors could explain not only the lack of a bamboo zone on Kilimanjaro but also offers possible explanations for the patterns of diversity and endemism. If true, Kilimanjaro's forests would serve as a striking example of the large and long-lasting influence of both animals and humans on the African landscape. Physical features Kilimanjaro rises approximately 5,100 m, 16,732 feet, from its base in the plains near Moshi. Kibo is capped by an almost symmetrical cone with scarps rising 180 to 200 m on the south side. These scarps define a 2.5 km wide caldera. Within this caldera is an inner crater, the Roush Crater. This inner crater was named after Dr. Richard Roush. The name was conferred by the government of Tanganyika in 1954 at the same time it awarded Roush a gold medal on having climbed Kilimanjaro for the 25th time. Roush climbed Kilimanjaro 65 times and helped to establish the exact elevation of the crater. Within the Roush crater lies the ash pit. The Roush crater itself is nearly surrounded by a 400 feet, 120 m, high dune of volcanic ash. Ice In the late 1880s, the summit of Kibo was completely covered by an ice cap with outlet glaciers cascading down the western and southern slopes, and except for the inner cone, the entire caldera was buried. Glacier ice flowed also through the western breach. An examination of ice cores taken from the North Ice Field Glacier indicates that the snows of Kilimanjaro, also known as glaciers, have a basal age of 11,700 years. A continuous ice cap covering approximately 400 square kilometers, 150 square miles, covered the mountain during the period of maximum glaciation, extending across the summits of Kibo and Mwenzi. The glacial ice survived drought conditions during a three-century period beginning 2200 BC. The period from 1912 to present has witnessed the disappearance of more than 80% of the ice cover on Kilimanjaro. From 1912 to 1953 there was 1% annual loss, while 1989 to 2007 saw 2.5% 2 annual loss. Of the ice cover still present in 2000, 26% had disappeared by 2007. While the current shrinking and thinning of Kilimanjaro's ice fields appears to be unique within its almost 12 millennium history, it is contemporaneous with widespread glacier retreat in mid to low latitudes across the globe. At the current rate, Kilimanjaro is expected to become ice free sometime between 2022 and 2030.